So let's now discuss NAC treatment. So firstly, how do we decide whether someone needs to have NAC treatment or not? So I'm going to go over the basics of this decision. However, your hospital will most likely have a policy or a protocol that will go into this in more detail. So we'll just cover the basics here. So whether we, how we decide whether someone needs NAC or not depends hugely on when they've taken the overdose and whether the overdose was an all-in-one overdose or a staggered overdose. So the crucial thing that guides our decision making is a figure, a time frame of eight hours. So this is really important. If you give someone NAC within eight hours of them having taken a paracetamol overdose, and we're assuming that's an all-in-one go paracetamol overdose, then you will almost certainly protect them completely from hepatonecrosis. They will not get hepatonecrosis if you manage to give NAC within eight hours of them taking the overdose. So this massively determines how we make this decision about giving NAC. If the patient presents very late, let's say after 10 hours of taking the overdose, then we are not going to make a clever decision. We're just going to give the NAC immediately. And what I mean by clever decision is we can do blood tests. We can measure the level of paracetamol in the blood. We can also do tests that test the state of the liver, how healthy the liver is. Those can also guide us on whether we're going to give NAC. That's a more clever decision using those. If, however, the patient has presented late at 10 hours, we don't have time to do all those blood tests and wait for them to come back before commencing the NAC. Instead, we just Im commence it immediately to protect the patient. NAC is not a particularly dangerous medication, even when given intravenously. So you're not going to cause damage to the patient by giving them NAC. So the philosophy is it's better to over-treat, give people NAC when they might actually not need it, than to under-treat and not give them that when they really, really do need it because they'll come to great harm if they're not given that when they really do need it. So if they present late, then we don't wait for blood tests. We don't make a clever decision. We just give NAC immediately. Also, if they present with a staggered overdose, you know, it's been occurring for days now, the paracetamol level has been building in the blood potentially to toxic levels. Again, we don't wait for a clever decision to be made with blood tests. We just immediately commence the NAC. We can always stop it. You know, we can stop the NAC infusion if we decide later, once the blood tests have come back, that it's not necessary. Also, if the patient doesn't know when they've actually taken the overdose or isn't able to tell you or isn't cooperative and won't tell you when they've taken it. Again, usually we just commence NAC in that situation. We don't wait for the blood test to come back. The situation where we do make a cleverer decision and we use the blood test is when they've presented really quickly. So if they presented, for instance, after two hours of ingesting the paracetamol overdose, that's where we don't need to commence the NAC immediately. We can do the blood test, wait for the blood test to come back, and then use the blood test to make a decision about whether to commence NAC. If it's approaching the eight hours mark, so let's say they present after seven hours of taking a paracetamol overdose, that is getting too close to the eight hours now. You know, we might be able to do blood tests really quickly and get them back really quickly, but we might not get the blood test back in time. So usually if it's close to the eight hour mark, we just commence NAC. It's only if they present really early and we've got a lot of time to play with that we then do wait for the blood test to come back and make a clever decision about whether we're actually going to give NAC or not. So let's discuss in more detail the case where we do have enough time to make a cleverer decision based on blood tests as to whether NAC is necessary. So let's take an example. So let's say we have a patient who has taken 30 paracetamol, so a significant overdose. They presented well before that eight hours time threshold. So let's say they've presented after two hours of ingestion of the paracetamol and they are completely compliant, completely regretful, and completely with it. So we trust that the information that they are giving us is accurate. This is the sort of patient where we can make a cleverer decision as to whether they need NAC or not. Now, what we do is we actually wait for four hours post-ingestion before doing blood tests. And this is because one of the blood tests that's going to be crucial in deciding whether they need treatment or not is the paracetamol level in their blood. Now, of course, when they've just taken the paracetamol, it's initially in the GI tract and it has to be digested and then absorbed into the bloodstream. So the reason we wait till four hours post-ingestion is that that's the accepted time period when all of the paracetamol will now have been absorbed. So the level isn't going to go up further after that. Whatever we get the level as when we take the blood at four hours. If we take it again, 
in an hour's time, at five hours, the level will have gone down. It won't have gone up. So that's why we wait till four hours to doing until doing the blood test. Now you might ask, well, isn't this wasting time? Surely we want to initiate NAC as soon as possible. Well, it's generally medically accepted that you don't actually need to initiate NAC as soon as you possibly can. That if you give NAC in, let's say, well, we could give it in this patient as soon as they arrive. So after two hours of the ingestion, it's generally medically accepted that that isn't necessary. That as long as you initiate the NAC within the eight hour time window, the outcome will be just as good as if you were to initiate it the moment they come into the hospital. So the reason for that is, of course, you know, it takes a bit of time for the paracetamol to firstly get into the blood, then build up to a toxic enough level, and then actually start having the hepatotoxic effect. You know, the moment the paracetamol gets to the toxic level, it isn't the case that it suddenly starts to kill the liver. It takes a little bit of time additionally before it starts to actually exert the hepatotoxic effect. So you do have time where you don't need to initiate NAC and you can just wait uh, and do these blood tests at four hours. So this is the generally accepted medical protocol that you wait until four hours after ingestion, you do the blood tests, you get the blood test back, usually the blood test in a big hospital will be back within an hour, and then you can look at initiating the NAC within that five to eight hour period, and the outcome will be just as good as if you had initiated it the moment they arrived. So it's generally medically accepted that you don't need to initiate NAC in that first zero to four hours post-ingestion period, that the ideal time window to initiate it is in the four to eight hour period. As long as, in, as it's initiated before that eight hour period, then they're going to be protected from hepatonecrosis. So for this patient then, what we're going to do is we're going to wait until four hours post ingestion, and then we're going to do blood tests. And the crucial things that we're going to do in the blood tests are we're going to measure the paracetamol level in the blood. We're also going to measure the function of the liver. So we're going to do LFTs. Now LFTs usually include four blood tests. They include bilirubin, ALT, ALP, and albumin. Now the crucial one in paracetamol overdose is ALT. Bilirubin, remember, is this waste product that's broken down by the liver. It takes quite a long period of the liver misfunctioning before the bilirubin starts to go up. So it's not going to have gone up just four hours post paracetamol overdose. I mean, the paracetamol probably hasn't even begun to exert its hepatotoxic effect at four hours. So you're not going to see bilirubin going up um, quickly. Albumin also is a protein that's produced by the liver. Again, its half-life is not that short that you're going to see significant changes in it that quickly. So albumin we're not so interested in either. It takes days to weeks of liver misfunctioning before albumin begins to fall. ALP and ALT are markers of injury to the liver. ALP is more injury to the tubes, the bile ducts inside the liver whereas ALT is actually a marker of injury of the hepatocytes themselves. So ALT is the crucial one in paracetamol overdose. ALP tends to not go up, or if it does go up, it doesn't go up that much at all in paracetamol overdose, whereas ALT can go through the roof. So normally, a normal ALT level should be, some people say less than 30, some people say less than 40. In paracetamol overdose, it can go up into the hundreds, even the thousands, because hepatocytes are being injured. So ALT is the crucial LFT that we're looking at in paracetamol overdose. The other thing is that we measure clotting, so we measure INR. So the liver also produces clotting factors that are placed into the blood, and they are what allow the blood to clot. And um, if you are bleeding somewhere, they stop you from bleeding. The blood coagulates, clots. If the liver has been injured and is misfunctioning, then the production of clotting factors will be massively reduced. And clotting factors do have a very short half-life. So the levels will drop very quickly once the liver has started to drop its production of them. So you can see INR changes much more quickly. Now, INR should be around 1 or at least less than 1.3. The higher it is, 
the longer it takes for the blood to clot. That's literally what INR means. So if your INR is free, it means that your blood takes three times as long to clot as it should do in a normal individual. Whereas if it's one, it means it takes exactly the right amount of time, one times the amount of time it should take in order for a normal person's blood to clot. So ideally it should be less than 1.3. Now, actually, at four hours post-ingestion, even of this significant paracetamol overdose, it's very unlikely that that paracetamol will have begun to have a hepatotoxic effect thus far. So it's very likely that both the ALT and the INR are going to be normal at this point. So the one that's really crucial in our decision making is actually this paracetamol level. And I've been on the Google again, and I've typed in this time paracetamol treatment curve. Now, your hospital in its paracetamol overdose protocol will have one of these curves that you're supposed to use within it and you should use that in real clinical practice but I've got these ones up from Google here and what these are showing I think we'll go to this one this one looks clear now it is a little bit difficult to see because we're zooming in so much but what we've got here is time from ingestion on the x-axis here. And you'll note the curve only starts to be plotted at four. Before that period, it's not even on here. So that's why you really should take bloods at four hours post ingestion. And then what we've got on this side, on the y-axis, is paracetamol level in the blood. And it's difficult to see the units here, but I think that should say milligrams per litre. So we've got zero milligrams per litre here, 50 here, 100 here, 150 here. So what you do is you measure the paracetamol level at four hours post-ingestion, if you can. Of course, if the patient presents after five hours, then you're not going to be able to measure the level at four hours post-ingestion. Instead, you just do blood tests the moment they arrive, and therefore you've got um, bloods at five hours post-ingestion, so you use, you'd use this part of the curve instead. And then what you do is you look at the level that you have got from your blood test, and if it is above this treatment curve that is in red here, that's when you treat with NAC. If it is below the treatment curve, then you don't treat with NAC. So in our patient where we've done the blood test at four hours post-ingestion, if it came back as, say, 80, that would indicate that we don't need to treat with NAC. If it came back as 200, that is clearly above this level up here, which I think is 150, so we therefore would need to treat with NAC. So let's now try and summarise then the basics of this treatment decision. So if the patient presents after eight hours or very close to eight hours, then you just treat with NAC. You don't try and get blood tests and wait for those results to come back before initiating the NAC. Whereas if they present quicker than that, if they present before four hours, you actually wait until four hours and then you do blood tests at that point. If they present after let's say five or six hours, then you just do blood tests the moment they arrive, and then you wait for that paracetamol level to come back, and it should come back within an hour of you sending it, and then you use one of these paracetamol treatment curves to work out whether you need to give NAC or not. If a patient presents with a staggered overdose, again, you can't do this, you just treat with NAC. If the patient doesn't know when they took it or isn't willing to tell you when they took it, then again, you just treat with NAC. Overall, it is better to treat than not to treat, better to over-treat than under-treat.